every year from spring until fall, California's fruit harvest is in high gear. At Weimer Farms in California's San Joaquin Valley, they're picking nectarines. For all growers, stretching the harvest season means raising different varieties of the same fruit. We have varieties planted specifically throughout the different times of the season to fulfill those different time slots for providing fruit to the marketplace. So a typical variety of nectarines may harvest for two to three weeks. A good harvest depends on fruit that looks and tastes its best. To add maximum appeal to a nectarine, most growers line the orchard rows with strips of mylar. The reflective surface concentrates the sun's rays into the tree canopy, promoting photosynthesis and increasing the sugar content and color quality of the fruit. And that's when the fruit's actually going through its sizing process. It's when it's developing its sugar, developing its color. And so we're trying to maximize its environment during that, that particular critical time point before harvest. As the workers begin picking, growers will spot check the fruit to verify their decision to start harvesting. So what we'll do when we're trying to decide whether we're harvesting properly is and we'll sample them with the penetrometer to see what the flesh firmness is to determine whether we are picking the level we want. So we just quickly just shave a piece of the skin off and then we use this plunger to push in there and the force that it takes to push that in will then determine the flesh firmness. This one rated at 11. Picking is no longer the last step in the harvest. In many cases, it's just the beginning. Edo Packing Company is one of the largest fruit packers in the country. The 10-acre facility operates three state-of-the-art packing lines for boxing peaches, plums, blueberries, apples, and many other fruits. Today, it's nectarines and pomegranates. In one shift, the workers can pack up to 120,000 boxes of fruit on two lines. All of it sorted according to size, color, and degree of ripeness. We become almost the warehouse for the grocery stores, so they'll give us an order and give us only like a one or two day lead time to pack it, put it on a truck, and get it over to anywhere in the United States. After it's picked, a piece of fruit has a limited lifespan. Sophisticated post-harvest handling is a way to stall for time. At Edo, the race to preserve freshness starts with a cold shower. The hydro cooler pours frigid 32 degree water over the fruit to reduce its internal temperature and slow down decay. This is absolutely crucial in maintaining good quality. In the harvest season in California in the summertime, our temperatures can be well over 90 degrees Fahrenheit, even 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And the fruit will lose quality quite quickly, will dry and lose sugars. The cooled fruit quickly makes its way onto the sorting line for a quick wash and wax. After it's rinsed, it's sprayed with a vegetable oil product to help prevent moisture loss during the long journey to the supermarket. Before sizing begins, inspectors use their highly trained senses to remove the subpar fruit. As they touch it, they're looking for a soft shoulder or soft tip on the fruit that would bruise or damage easily and could later decay in transit. So that that piece of fruit that's a little bit too soft is then removed. The rejects are diverted and will later produce juices, jams, and other processed products. The fruit that passes inspection continues its journey to the high-speed sorting line. For centuries, farmers have sorted fruit to achieve uniform shipping weights and to satisfy consumer preference. The first packing houses used crude sizers with wooden slats or holes through which the smaller sized fruits would drop. Today, the optical fruit sizer is a faster, more accurate method. 
the fruit is first diverted onto a single file cup conveyor, moving at about 10 pieces per second. As it passes into the sorter, each piece is rotated and photographed by two lenses. An infrared lens gathers shape and dimensional data, and a color lens collects the color qualities of the fruit. The camera quickly snaps 25 photos to create a two-dimensional projection of the entire fruit. From this picture, the computer interprets its exact size, shape, and color. Now we've got a full look at it, and then we can determine if the amount of color that we see, red versus yellow, is the appropriate color that's desirable for packing. And that's helpful in markets where we want to send fruit of a uniform size, color, and shape. Once the computer obtains the mug shots of a certain piece of fruit, a timing device triggers a lifting finger that deposits the fruit into a specific lane according to size and color. This high-tech sorter delivers near-identical fruit to each of many packing lines. After a final human inspection, the fruit is hand-packed in a variety of boxes. Then it's conveyed by forklift into a cold storage room where it's stored at an ideal or optimum temperature that actually puts the fruit to sleep. Once the fruit is in that condition or in that state, it's in the best environment to be transported from California to the various markets in the Midwest or the East Coast. The packing house can even hold boxed fruit at a higher temperature to force ripening. Sophisticated post-harvest handling of fruit is a progression in a ritual that has remained otherwise unchanged over thousands of years. This Egyptian tomb drawing, dated at 1900 BC, depicts two workers harvesting a fig tree. The key components of harvest are the same. One's picking the fruit and then putting it into a basket. The other is sorting the fruit and putting it into a consumer package. The practices involved in, in picking and packing are basically still the same and haven't changed. Ancient Egypt is one of the birthplaces of horticulture. The first growers learned to irrigate their fields by tapping the Nile River's seasonal floods. But without modern technologies, these growers were faced with the problem of spoilage. They didn't have refrigeration, they didn't have canning, they didn't have these other processes to preserve the harvested crop. So the crop had to either be consumed fresh soon after harvest or dried and, and uh, stored dried. China was the birthplace of temperate fruits, such as peaches and pears, more than 4,000 years ago. The Greeks and Romans oversaw a thriving fruit trade throughout the Mediterranean. When Mount Vesuvius erupted in 79 AD, the Romans were cultivating extensive orchards containing peaches, citrus trees, and grapes on its very slopes. During the Middle Ages, monks were the most sophisticated growers. They practiced the skills of tree grafting and crossbreeding to produce new varieties of fruit trees. The colonists brought Europe's fruit tree saplings to the New World. But the true American orchard revolution was again fueled by monks. As the Spanish moved north into California and established missions in the 1600s, the monks took advantage of the dry climate and raised large orchards of grapes, figs, peaches, pears, and apricots. As settlers moved to California in the 1800s, the orchards fanned out to supply the new urban centers of Los Angeles and San Francisco. Growers also planted in the Sierra foothills to feed the influx of gold miners. California fruit production exploded in the 1890s when refrigerated railroad cars allowed growers to ship fresh fruit to the huge East Coast markets. But in the coming decades, the small family-operated farm would nearly vanish. Farms began to get bigger primarily because of competition. 
there's a continuing pressure to reduce the price of fruits and vegetables at retail market. And that means the farms generally have to get larger in size to take advantage of economies of scale. Large vertically integrated growing and packing operations are now the standard in U.S. fruit production. Labor remains the most unpredictable and expensive cost a grower bears. The future status of an untold number of undocumented workers could have a tremendous impact on harvest costs. In the 1960s, engineers from the University of California at Davis began testing a multitude of mechanical fruit harvesters. Various tree shakers and shake and catch machines were very effective at harvesting fruit quickly. But the percentage of damaged fruit was unacceptable. Half a century later, there are still no commercially viable mechanical harvesters for picking many types of fresh fruit. One solution may be a man-machine interface that allows laborers to more efficiently access the tree canopy. Here, a pear grower and engineers from UC Davis are testing a modified European-built platform in Northern California. The machine offers six movable picking platforms at three different heights, allowing the harvesters to move laterally or up and down inside the tree canopy. So the workers, instead of placing fruit into bags and delivering it to bins, would place fruit two or three at a time into little feeder conveyors that fed into a main elevator. At the top of the main elevator, the fruit would go into what's called a bin filler, where the fruit is lowered and placed into a rotating bin, which ensures even distribution of the fruit in the bin. By eliminating the need to carry heavy ladders and picking bags, the platform might expand the potential workforce to include more women and older laborers. It could also improve worker safety and reduce workers' compensation claims from ladder falls, a major problem for many growers. The harvesting platform has already gained a firm footing in Europe, where hand labor has been in short supply for decades. In the American Midwest, one harvest has eliminated the human hand entirely and put the picking and packing house on wheels.